up. So make sure if you're watching the youth pods on YouTube, then make sure you comment. Let us know you're watching. And we had some great feedback on uh, some of it last week. We asked kind of what foot he was and someone that coached him actually got in touch with us and said we coached him to use both feet. So nice. people are watching, which is good. Thank you very much. The following podcast contains some strong language and some very average opinions. Any references to actual people are wildly inaccurate. It's probably best if you don't listen at all. The Roaring Peacock Podcast. Hello and welcome back to the Roaring Peacock Youth Podcast, episode number three. This is to uh, talk about the Leeds B and Stoke. We're going to preview uh, Wolverhampton Wanderers game coming up this week. Uh, talk about our player profile this week of Charlie Creswell. And also we've got a guest on. Uh, the Leeds United Youth Commentator will be joining us in a bit to talk about some of uh, his experiences and help us preview Wolves. But before we get to any of that, I'm your host, Ross. And with me, as ever, is Cookie. Hello, I am Ross's older brother. Can you not tell <laughs> Mitchell Brothers up here on your YouTube screen. <laughs> and then down below us, if you're watching on YouTube, is Rob with more hair than both of us put together. Yeah, good evening. That's why I put the hat on. Didn't want to embarrass you, chap. Cheers, mate. We appreciate that. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, right, let's get straight into it then. We played Stoke on Monday with a pretty good full strength team. Um, lots of uh, senior players in. I'll just run through the team quickly for anyone that didn't see it. It was uh, Alec Prier in goal. Uh, Lorente, Davis and Creswell made up a back three with Costa and Huggins as the uh, wingbacks. Uh, Calvin played in central midfield with Jenkins and Greenwood and then Roberts and Paveda kind of formed a, a strike partnership um, up top. It was a, a convincing as a convincing 1-0 win can be, boys. It was similar to the, the game before a little bit in the sense that the first half was quite a bit better than the second half. It was a tough game. I think... It's a weird one to judge as an under-23 game because there were so many first-teamers. I mean, I think there's one of the tweets I put out about who would we see as breaking through and the first thing I got was Lorente, you know, <laughs> because he obviously scored the goal. Um, but, I mean, for me, it was another really excellent performance from the man we're going to be talking about today, Creswell. Um, looked solid as a rock at, at centre-half. Um, so, yeah, it, it was decent all round. It wasn't a spectacular game. Um, but bear in mind that we lost to them 4-0 earlier in the season. Um, a good revenge win. Yeah, it was controlled. That's the kind of thing that came to my mind, especially, um, I mean, first 45, I think their keeper was man of the match, if I'm honest. Um, yeah. somebody, he, he, he was clearly the best player that they had on the pitch and he kept him in it a lot. Um, I think for us, we controlled it and did what we needed to do, pretty much like what Cookie said, when we... Look, look at the, the games before we've managed to see them out. I thought for the second half, the discipline wasn't there from our side. I think the fouls stats show that. And I think we lost our way with discipline. Could be, you know, you've lost some of those first 11 players that came off at half time. So some of the younger mm. ones, fresh legged, a bit excited, a bit eager to perform. I think um, at one point the camera cut and Bielsa was kind of marching down the touchline <laughs> on, the, on the near side. So you could see that maybe a few of them were trying to want to impress or wanted to perform. For, for maybe various reasons. But apart from slight lack of discipline in the second half, without being overcritical, I think we controlled it and we did what we needed to do. We had plenty of opportunities to score, I think. Was it, um, I just got the shots, like 16 shots, four on target, um, yeah. 61% possession, 454 passes, uh, 81% pass accuracy. It was a controlled, another good performance by the under-23s. Yeah, I'd yeah, be really intrigued one. to know, you know, if, um, if we were ever able to get Mark Jackson on here, which I'm not sure if we could, but if we could... I'd be interested yeah. to know how much pressure he gets from Bielsa and the first team set up to put first teamers into that team um, mm. or whether he's involved in the discussion around rehabilitation and form and how that interacts with how we get that experience into the side to lift some of the, the younger guys. Um, I'd be kind of just intrigued yeah. to know. I feel like it's probably forced on him. Well, there are six first team players in that squad. So more than the actual on the 23s. I suppose if you count Creswell, um, uh, sorry, uh, Leif Davis and Roberts is kind of it. He's first team player, and he does although he does play a lot for the, the youth. So it's, it was more a heavily weighted uh, game for the older players, but they needed they needed uh, that. Calvin didn't have a game this weekend because his suspension, so he played set up the goal for Lorente, who needed the game as well to get some more fitness back Definitely. before he can make his way back to the first team. 
and all those players look good. Tyler Roberts always looks good and, uh, with the kids. And yeah, I mean, Calvin controlled the game first half in midfield. But yeah, Lorente back post header. We could do with some of that for the first team, couldn't we? Uh, did you not feel? I think we spoke about it in the pod before. You feel a little bit for the younger ones, don't you? I'm pleased to see. I think somebody. Um, in our WhatsApp group, actually, it mentioned that um, Drame and a couple of the others that had performed previously trained with the first eleven this week. So, despite yeah. the fact that they they were kind of missing from the the, the lineup against Stoke in the under twenty threes, they got that kind of upskill to come and, and train with the first eleven, which I think is a nice reward for them because they've been key performers in the previous. And I know we discussed it and said it is critical that the under twenty threes links the whole. Setup of, of Leeds United from first eleven under eighteens and below. You you want this kind of seamless glow, but it is a shame for the ones that played in the games before that so many first eleven players came in and just kind of took their positions. But <laughs> mm. having said that, they've got things to prove. I thought Paveda had a really good game. His speed, as always, which we know, and his footwork was excellent. Um, and what impressed me most about Lorente, despite the fact he scored the goal, nice header back post, like you say, um, his interceptions and his reading of yeah. the game for obviously is what, what we're going to need at centre half. We we finally might not have a makeshift centre half for the next <laughs> game, but um, he he read the game really well for whilst he was on the pitch, and I really was impressed with his kind of interceptions and. He gave some of those Stoke kids a few digs as well. He, he let people know they were in for a game. He let people know they were in for a game, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, what yeah, a way! That's what you want. To, yeah, what a way to help Creswell learn. Um, you know, the man we're going to be talking about today. I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned that. You know, because when you saw the first team training video, my first thought when I saw the under 23s lineup was Crescentio Somerville, who we talked about last week, has obviously left Feyenoord, left first team Eredivisie football to play in the under 23s, and then mm. scores a hat trick and then get dropped, and you'd be like, wow. But you feel like maybe the reward for that is, and, and Somerville was one of those players who was training with the first team this week, and ask yourself this, if you were an under-23, would you rather be playing in under-23s games, or would you rather be training with the first team with the possibility of breaking into the first team squad? I know if I was an under-23, which one I would prefer. Yeah. I think a mixture of both is important. Just to, yeah. I'm so sorry to jump in. I, I do think it is good that there is this. We've spoke about it on on the first two pods as well. But this kind of seamless between your kind of fringe first eleven subs players into the into that under twenty threes, which you know Roberts, Paveda, Costa, more recently Costa. Anyway, they find themselves mm-hmm. in that pot of people, don't they? Leaf Davis, they they find themselves in that group. So yeah, but I agree with you. If you're Somerville, you, your reward for the hat trick is well, I get to knock around with the big boys for a bit before we play Newcastle. So. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. I could see him being in that squad, you know, potentially. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, Bielsa's not afraid to throw these kids onto the bench, is he? And give them an no. opportunity if the game kind of it flows the way where there's a chance to play one of these guys. It's unless your name's Robbie Gotts, unfortunately. But <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm always impressed with Leif Davis. I think he's a very, very good footballer. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't do. think he's ever going to be a first team centre back, though. Unfortunately for him, I think he could be a first team left back, but. He seems to stick with Alioski more than give Davis that chance. Yeah, I mean, I think Leif Davis is of an age now where he's kind of make or break into that first team, I think. And I think, mm. don't get me wrong, you can progress a little bit later, but most players get through from the academy between sort of 18 and 21 and he's at that older end of things. I, I, I think he's got a lot of capability, um, mm. but... Um, in all honesty, he, he had some really poor moments. There was a highlight reel that came out of him taking on some players and progressing the ball forward. Um, and that was about the best thing. He gave the ball away sloppily quite a lot in that game. And for someone who's got more first-team experience, that's kind of not what you'd expect. So I'm not mm. sure he'll make that step up, but we've been surprised before. There was a time when I never thought Calvin would be what he is and look where he is now. <laughs> he is the blueprint for when people write you off, look at yeah. what the, look at what I've done. So every possibility for all of them players. Yeah. What did you think of the formation? I was a bit... At first, I couldn't tell if Pavetta was playing, you know, attacking right wing inside inside forward, I think. You know, I don't know the the correct terminology for that kind of position. But then it did seem at some points like the midfield five was flat across with Costa and Huggins instead of being wing backs, being almost like a a five-man midfield. And then Pereira yeah. and Roberts been nine and ten. I, I, I don't know what I thought about the formation. And maybe they did that to counter Stoke's threat. I think Cookie mentioned it. They're, they're, they're not a terrible team, and their youngsters proved that when they when they thrashed us four 0 earlier on in the season. So maybe it was a learning point, and they've decided to counter their style of play by doing it that way. But mm. it was a surprise to me. 
I think it's probably it's just more s- experimentation, if I'm honest with you, those players for the first team as to where he can and can't use them. I don't think at this level when you're using that many first teamers, as much as I'm not saying the disrespect Stoke, I don't mm. think you consider your formation based on what they're doing when you have that many first teamers involved. I think it's more experimentation, but who knows what goes through the mind of Mr. Marcelo Bielsa and Mark <laughs> Jackson when he's um, talking to him, who I'm sure has a mind of his own. Yeah, he could be using it as a chance to see kind of what, how does this formation work? How do these players fit into this formation for the first team as well? Like, yeah, it's, it's, I wouldn't be averse against seeing us in the Premier League games playing three five two at that point. Because no, we are getting flooded in midfield a lot of the time recently. So it could be kind of an answer to that almost. Yeah, potentially. <laughs> uh, but yes, so that's another win. It keeps us top of the table. We've played 13 1 9 now. Uh, we'll mention uh, Wolves later in the show. They're currently second. Um, they drew with Burnley 0 0, and we thrashed Burnley. So, I mean, we're going to thrash Wolves, aren't we? As well. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> that's how it works, isn't it? I think. <laughs> Uh, so we're not going to d- delve too deep into the loan watch this week, but I've just seen that uh, Robbie Gotts is going to make his home debut for the, um, that Salford team. Uh, <laughs> Scum light. Yeah, one of the Salford teams. There's quite a few of them. Uh, so, yeah, he seems to be starting regular football for them, at least. Maybe at Lincoln he wasn't getting quite as many games, as, as much game time as he could do. So he's starting games, if it's League 2 rather than League 1. I'm sure the difference isn't that huge. Yeah, and I think what we'll do is obviously next week on the pod, I'm sure we'll delve deeper into to loan watch. I think for me, for anyone who's watching on YouTube, I'd be interested to know in the comments from anybody about anyone in particular on loan they'd like us to look at, how they're performing, mm. what, what that looks like. So if anyone's got any interest in what they think, just drop, drop a comment and we'll um, we'll have a look a bit more of a deeper dive into one of those guys. You, McCallumonts, yeah. etc. We're not quite at Chelsea, but there's a lot of kids out there playing football for other teams. Absolutely, that's true. That. <clears throat> so let's get on to our player profile before we get our guest on this week. It's, I mean, it could only be Charlie Creswell this week. Probably the best prospect in the academy. It's tough with those two strikers we've got and a couple of fullbacks and wingers, but I mean, I think of, he's probably the best one. I guess of what you would call the the homegrown talent. If you take away from the big signings we've made, which have, let's be honest, they've come in for seven figure fees, your Greenwoods and your Somervilles and etc. You know, yeah. Drame. He's 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 not quite homegrown. He's obviously from Preston originally. Um, we all know who his dad is. Um, or for mm-hmm. the younger listeners, might not Richard Creswell, who was um, striker for Leeds back in two thousand five to two thousand and seven with. I would say mixed success, but mostly not success, given what we were like <laughs> back then, just after the Premier League and hope got up um, at first. But yeah, um, and obviously his dad went on to be involved in Leeds United in a sort of coaching stroke academy head of. So he was head of academy in 2018, um, but it didn't last too long, left in 2019, I think, for personal reasons. But um, Charlie has been with the academy since being a young lad. So he's been there, I think, for his entire career. If someone can tell me any different, he was with another club when he was younger um, from a, a big team perspective, then let us know. But as far as I can see, that was us. So he signed his first professional contract in 2019. Um, and that has now just recently been extended in November 2020. He signed a two and a half year extension up to 2023, which is great. Um, for me, I'll be honest with you, I've, I've talked about him probably most weeks on here, so you can probably tell he's my standout player in the academy. He is the most exciting prospect for me for what the first team needs. Um, he's a towering, powerful centre half, six foot tall, even though he's only you know just what about just short of eighteen and a half years old. Right footed, um, so he'll be nineteen in in August. Already been called up to England under nineteens. He made his first team debut, Carabao Cup against Hull City in September last year. Um, the things that stand out is he's, he's excellent with the ball at his feet, accurate, short and long distribution, definitely not shy of making a tackle. So if anyone wants to have a look on the Leeds United official channel at the Burnley under 23 highlights for some of the sliding tackles he made and previous. Um, but one of the things that excites me about him, uh, bear in mind where we are currently, is not only ability to play the ball with his feet, but his ability in the air, both boxes, um, makes plenty of defensive headers at corners, um, and we missed that in the first team, I think. Um, and Scott, he scored his first goal this season, so he's also scored in the 7-1 demolition of Fulham um, the other week. And he got two goals against Hull City in the um, under-18s FA Youth Cup last season, which he capped in the side. So he can score a goal as well, reads the game really well, 
he reminds me a little bit, not not completely, because I don't want to make too many comparisons, but with Jonathan Woodgate, he looks substantially stronger at this age um, yeah. and has a long way to go. He's got the capability of someone like Woody, but just to even come close to having that capability would be great. Uh, but main thing that stands out for me, guys, just maturity, natural leadership, um, the passing range, ability to dribble out of defence. You know, he stands out from his peers in that sense. His confidence on the ball looks very suited to Bielsa ball style, where even under pressure, mm. he's, he's really composed on the ball. So a very, very, for me, exciting prospect. <laughs> Nothing left to say, is there? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> he's exactly all of what Cookie said. He, he's he's a, he's the all round kind of. I know there's some there is some quality in that under twenty three squad, but again, I I also lean towards him as my pick of the kind of homegrown non signed talent that will probably uh, or has probably impressed me the most. If I, if I had to say that, um, I think he's he's regular position at centre back. He he sort of one of the first names on the sheet. I don't I wouldn't think there's many many more. That challenge him unless you're dropping down from the first 11. So I, I like everything about him <clears throat> for all the right reasons, exactly what Cookie said. He seems to have the ability to, to read a game. I think that exposure to your Laurentes of this world that we discussed is, is critical for him because there is sometimes his decision making for me, you know, it's, it's kind of on the on the spot decision making can be called into question, but he commands well, he can put a tackle in and uh, he knows, he seems to know what's going on around him at all times. I just don't yeah. know if the process after that is always right, where he's saying, right, okay, can I lay the ball off? Will I knock it out wide? Am I going to? But that will come with time. He's a young lad. I think you said he's 18 and a half years. He's or 18. Not years. even, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, he'll be 19 in August. I mean, like you say, he's, he's young. He's developing. He's going to have to develop certain parts of his game, but he's stepped up seamlessly from under 18s into, into under 23s. And oh, yes. Yeah. Whilst right. having a footballing dad doesn't guarantee you being brilliant at football, having a footballing dad who brings you up with talking about football, understanding the intricacies of football, it, it helps, doesn't it, I think? Of course. And I think he's not done He's not done many games in the under-23s of memory serves where he's, he's been subbed off or swapped off. He's he's done a lot of he's putting a lot of ninety minute shifts for the under twenty three, so that shows that Jackson's got a lot of trust in him. Um, yeah, it's usually yeah, him and Katie. Shows, yeah, yeah, usually exactly. him and Katie are the first choice centre halves. Put, put, putting in ninety minutes against you know some of these squads like we said before. I know we're top of the league and we have we have embarrassed a few teams, but some of the games have been quite. We've had to show composure and we've had to battle out the result, especially when things get a bit open and exposed late in the second half. And he always seems to pop up with a good challenge at the right time. So. I'd like to um, see him exposed a bit more, but of course, um, mm. that will come with better quality of opposition. That will come as he develops, as you've said. Was he on the bench for Spurs? If I'm wrong, he was. I'm not sure. Corner. You know, he's only had one call up to the first half. I think he was on the bench, he but he was. didn't come on. Yeah, I mean, one yeah. of my main thoughts with with Creswell, the one thing that I'm still questioning that I've not seen yet, and it's hard to judge at under 23s, is um, does he have that pace? Um, I don't think you see centre-halves having to deal with a lot of pacey forwards at that, at that level. Not not intelligent pacey yeah. forwards. Anyway, no offence to the other the other teams, but it's it's rare. Um, so does he have the pace to step up? That'll probably be the biggest question, I think. But um, yeah, I've not seen that tested, but it, it looks very good. And I suppose, do you have to have pace? Do you associate Jonathan Woodgate with, with pace? I don't associate John Terry with pace as much of a... Um, yeah, wanker he is. <laughs> as long as you can get the, the tackle in, it doesn't matter if you're at the ball immediately or if you're there. At the, Radaby didn't never had pace, did he? But he no. knew exactly where to be. He knew how to get that ball off the, the attacker at the perfect time. It's, exactly. Yeah, Cooper hasn't got a lot of pace either, but he's he's pretty much holding his own in the Premier League against some of the best strikers in the world. So, yeah, it, as long as you've got the positioning. A lot, lot to be excited about with him, with Cresswell. He's... Uh, He's a, he's a good player, and he links well with the with the lads around him. You know, considering mm. like you've said, there are a lot of changes. We have spoken about it before in that that lineup, and different players from first eleven or rehabilitation players come in and out. His link up play is always solid. He doesn't really miss a beat on that. He seems to just kind of almost tele, telekinesis like understand where to lay that off when when he's not under pressure. Like I say, yeah. the only thing I question is when he wins a tackle. Sometimes the thought process after that, it's almost like he gets too excited and wants to lay yeah. off to the first available option. But that's just a maturity thing. I really like everything that we've seen so far. And like Cookie, I think I've said it, he's, he's, the, he's one of the standout talents for me. 
I think he's the real deal. I really do. I think he yeah. could be a superstar if he develops right. I think the next 12 months are going to be really key. I mean, some people might ask questions of, well, if he's that good, why is Oliver Casey the one who's getting more of a looking in the first team? But there's not far off. I think there's a good two years between them and Casey's the older. You know, yeah. he's still in a very early stage of his development. So I wouldn't judge it too much on that. And um, no offence to Casey, who I think is a very solid centre half yeah, in an under-23 well. setup. Um, for me, I do think Creswell looks the more naturally talented. Um, but yeah. who knows what hard work um, will prevail and who will end up breaking through or not breaking through. Um, we'll have to wait and see, won't we? Yeah, it's an exciting future for him. Um, we can welcome in our very first guest onto the Leeds United Roar and Peacock Youth Podcast. Fabulous. Uh, joining us now is the Leeds United Under-23 commentator, Thomas Hill. Welcome. Hi, guys. Nice to uh, nice to be here and um, hope you're all okay. It's a bit of a rarity this for me, so yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, very good to have you on there. <laughs> Thanks for coming along. Well, I know when Rob mentioned it, that he approached you. We all got pretty excited that we can get someone on there, and you're our first guest. So, a little bit, little bit stalker esque. I was thinking we were, <laughs> we were talking about people we'd like to see on the on the pod, and we were saying we we we've kind of started the youth podcast or the under twenty three focus podcast as, as a spin off yeah. under the Peacock's Raw umbrella. And this is show number three, and we had really positive feedback from shows one and two. And we thought, do you know what? What better than a man that kind of watches them week in, week out to give us a bit of insight and give our listeners a little bit of a, uh, a flavour of what he knows and what his thoughts are, because there seems to be a, I guess, probably a good place to start, a, a, a renewed interest in the under-23s, let's say, this season. There's more of an interest, or I've seen more buzz about the squad. Um, so I think it would be good, maybe, I don't know how you guys feel, if we start there, really, on, yeah. on you, Tom, and what your thoughts about the season so far are and how you came to be involved with it and take it from there, really. Uh, do you mean as in how I got the job originally or yeah I guess yeah I mean I think Cookie asked the question I sent a few over here what would be how, how did you get into it really yeah how do you end up in commentary so <laughs> so, so commentary so, so commentary to start with um, I I did all I did all the ropes of written journalism so I, I as a kid I just wanted to be I just wanted to be a written journalist that was what I wanted to be Um I did everything. I did the Evening Post, the Yorkshire Post, um, Sky Sports, Football 365. I just basically, for fat six summers, worked for free and commentary. If you'd have said to me 10 years ago, you'll commentate, I, I would have laughed in your face. <laughs> um, I, I don't like my own voice. I don't like the sound of it. Um, and then just as you develop and you go along, I, I got into an office and they just said, oh, can you record this news bulletin? And I said, oh, no. And they just said, <laughs> well, it, you know, if you do stuff like this, then it'll help. And I just said, Oh, okay. Um, I think it took me half an hour. Uh, I, I kept restarting it and starting it and starting it. And it was a, I think it was a Norwich City news bulletin for two minutes. And then lo and behold, you go from there. And I started to do like little bits of summarising for hospital radio. And I just loved it. And that was it then. And then I just went from there and thought, I, you know, this is something I really want to do. And um, I started doing like bookmaker commentaries, off tube studio commentaries. Oh, yeah. I did radio commentaries. Um, and hit the LUTV ones. <laughs> Uh, quite a funny story. So I don't know how uh, into your commentary you were a few years ago, but we did a pre-season friendly about three years ago, right. um, and I was out for it. We played Forest Green, maybe, and the commentator kept getting um, Samu Saiz and Jani mixed up, and <laughs> the fans were losing their mind over it. And I just remember like going on Twitter and thinking, like, what's the, what's the fuss? I don't understand. And I thought, well, if he gets them too confused, then I can do that job. So... <laughs> I just emailed Leeds and just said, oh, have you got any openings? And within a week and a half, I did my first 23s game. Wow. Well, <laughs> um, that, was, that was literally, I went, I went for a meeting and then they were just went, oh, we want a 23s commentator. We're going to take it a bit more seriously. And they said, oh, can you commit to every game? And I said, absolutely, I'll do everything. And then this is my this is, this, this is my third season. Um, I've done, well, we had a disrupted last year. And um, we did the first full one. And this is, you know, this is this is as you say, guys. This is, uh, I'd probably say, like, a, because we're in the Premier League and because the kids are doing so well and the, and the youth team's doing well and there's so much attention and everything just seems massive now. Um, yeah, I, it is. It's so good, you know, to, to you know to be involved. There's there's like a production line and. My, my my memories as a kid were going to watch the reserves for a pound, um, and that was that seemed to be a big thing. And obviously, I think for maybe six seven years that went that went away. So 
it, it is massive. I think it's, it's going really well. I'm sure we'll touch upon that later on and stuff. Um, but yeah, I think as a fan base now, it's it's nice to be split up. We, we play, it, well, whatever day the Premier League wants us to play. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, Monday, Friday is 23. So um, so yeah, I think I think the buzz around it is is warranted as well. I think for the first time now, we've got such a uh, an exciting um crop that's been there for two or three years now where you can actually see that path we, you know we've seen them go out on loan we've seen them come into the first team where I think we were all I think anyone looking from the outside were used to right who can we sell who you know in your league one your championship right he's good right where's he going he's quite good where's he gonna go mm. um so yeah it's it's been a it's been a weird journey to get to where I've gotten um yeah I love every minute of it it's something I really enjoy that's well cool and brilliant to have it on YouTube as well I think gives us a lot more access to it yeah, I think um, I think when we when we first start, when they first started to put them on YouTube, it was it was such a big hit that everyone could could do that or Twitter as well when it was on social media. Um, I know people that timed their lunch breaks around it and they could sit and just have a half an hour where the lunch breaks weren't just sat Monday and it was something to watch. But yeah. I think it's good for not only for us um, as media for for you guys to watch, but the players as well. I think it's a it's quite a good audience that you know they're on there somewhere. You know, rather than five minute snippets on the football league highlights where they might get you, you might get to see one pass they do. Um, you know, they can analyse themselves when they go back as well from home. So yeah, YouTube's such a it's a it's a big audience for all of us to go on as well. Yeah, yeah. I think the game on uh, Monday, the Stoke game, they had at times six six and a half thousand people watching. That's that's massive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I guess it's probably part of the club as well that. We're very blessed to to have a fan base that that is quite fanatic about that. I think if you put, I think if we were allowed to put our under tens on, somebody would watch it. It's just, it's just like that, isn't it? And I think if you, no offense to the teams in the league two and the conference, it's you just you just wouldn't have that. That's just how it. Yeah, well, I think Tom, to be honest with you, that was kind of the reason behind why. We've we've actually been talking about doing this podcast. We only started it a few weeks ago. We've actually been talking about doing it for about the last six months. Because I mean, for for me, without boring you, the reason I was obsessed when I first had a season ticket as a kid, I used to love seeing all the stuff about the youth team, like, and that was back in the days like Lee Matthews um, and those kind of guys, and all the goals they were scoring, and all you got it was in the match day program. And I was like, if I were a young lad now and I wanted to know more about the youth team, I wish there was something better to find out about it. And you guys having that on YouTube, I think, prompted us to go, why aren't we talking more about this? Why isn't there anything set up for it? And that's how we've ended up where we are, I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's. I think the PL2 is massive as well. And I know we've only been there for four months, but I think it's such a great platform for, for youngsters to... It's quite... A, it's very serious. And I think the... I always remember... I always, I always link these two together, but um, like when Alan Smith played for us, obviously he'd come in, in that, and he was in that youth cup team. And the youth cup, the under 18 youth cup, is is very prestigious. And the fact it's been suspended recently is obviously such a blow. Um, at the end of the day, youth football is. It, this is the sort of time now where either myself or you guys sitting discussing things. We could be sat here now, and in six years' time, one of our players could be the leading player in the Premier League. You know, that's the, you know, that is the scouting range we've got now, where we're picking people up and. That's the beauty of it. Right, so yeah, the, it? the bigger the audience, the better. Yeah, really. Oh exciting. yeah, it's yeah. You know, um, I always joke around. I, I, I'm I'm very very lucky to do to do the, to cover the team I cover because I know people before me that have watched our youth teams that no offense, you know, that haven't been as com- not committed, but there's not been as much as a pathway for them or. Yeah, you know they were nil nil. You know we've got some of the you know the, the brightest prospects that, that we've either snapped up or they've come through the sixteen. They've come through the. And they're all playing together now, um, and I know that this is a good, you know, this is a good crop. Whereas in the past, it, it hasn't been as, as as lucrative. But we've always still churned them out. You know, the, the, I, you know, this is not a criticism on what's gone before because the foundations have been there for years. You've seen the players that we've we've developed. So yeah, you're a Leeds fan, aren't you? Are you? Yes, yeah. mate. That well, that must be great then to get involved in the club as well. That must be brilliant. Ish. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I've got. A, yeah, I've got. A, yeah, yeah, I've got a season ticket, so it's. Um, it's it's obviously very weird to be to be sat in the press box on a on a twenty threes and then in the cop three days later watching and <laughs> it's quite nice because I get to obviously I get to do both sides I get to do the side where it's obviously very professional and very serious and I get to do the side where I'm with my friends and that's where I want to be and um, but yeah I've, I've been a fan mate since I was four or five. Oh, um, nice. Tom, so who's been uh, from your observations? Who's been the, got the standout of the academy so far this season? Well, I mean. Let's probably get a list together, guys. Um, Give us your top three, <laughs> if you can. I think Charlie. I think I think I'm not just saying this because obviously you've what, what you've done earlier today. I think Charlie Cresswell's been pretty massive, really. Um, 
he didn't start the first few games. Uh, we, you know, we had a different back four to what we've got now. Um, but yeah, he just he just looks like a player that's that's 23, 24. He's you know he's very powerful, yeah. um, very confident. He's puts himself about. It's, what I like as well is um, I guess from a from a commentator's perspective is he's he's always looking for the ball. He always wants to. If he makes a bad pass, he he doesn't bother. He just goes and gets it again. And um, I think he's just led by example at the back. You know, despite yeah. he's probably been one of the younger members of the team, he he just seemed to have really really developed. I think that's just reward for his England call up as well. We got to train with the youth team there. You know, that'll probably just give him his biggest confidence boost ever to to be down there with other other players from different camps. I think it's it's very tough to then pick another one. I've got so many favourites that, you know, that, have, that have really stood out. I guess. I guess you'd have to say Sam Greenwood. It's very hard to to ignore him. Uh, obviously, top scorer. The fact he's now a um, box to box centre midfielder as well. I mean, <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> so, it, it's something you learn with the twenty three. So me, me and Ben Parker always joked that Robbie Gotts played uh, right back for like the first six, seven games of the twenty threes, and then the play. I remember getting a team sheet for a commentary, and then he was in centre mid, and I was thinking, <laughs> what, what are they doing? And then he just he just ran the show, and I was just like, oh. <laughs> and then it, you just got that you just got that pattern where every single one of them just got put into a different position and just didn't look. You then forgot that they weren't centre bids or right backs beforehand. And I think with I think with Sam, obviously he what I like the best about him is how he looks so natural whether he gets it on his left or his right. You never know, especially as a commentator, you never know which way he's gonna go because obviously some of them have got traits where you you, you watch them that many times, you know that he's gonna go right or left or the left footed or right footed. With Sam, you just don't know what he's doing. Um, yeah, you know, obviously he, he's very confident. He's got he's so gifted with both feet in terms of his his shot power. And I joke about it on commentary, I, I, and I'm not being sarcastic. You know, he his tackling is is something that he he doesn't get right. But <laughs> I just love the fact that he just doesn't. He just goes in, and he's you know he's so determined to. <laughs> I love that. He don't what, get it right. <laughs> no, but it's. It, obviously, and he's. Uh, I'm not saying. I'm not saying he doesn't get it right. It's just obviously his booking suggests. Yeah, that, <laughs> we spoke about uh, the discipline actually on a mis- different episode. That he's mistimed it, but I, I just love the passion of him. I just love that that drive and yeah. that determination that you know his team need the ball back and he's going to go do what he can to get it. And I think you look at some strikers that are just they'd make the run and then they just get there and go. Oh, you know, never mind. Um, yeah. He's a winner. Isn't so he? I think it's yeah, yeah, I, and. I think it takes a lot of um, guts to obviously come from where he's. He's obviously gone from from home to Arsenal, obviously the other end of the country, and then he's settled there. He's impressed, and obviously he's, he doesn't think he can get in here and thinks he can get in at Leeds, and he just up sticks and come again. So it obviously shows that he's, from my point of view, he looks like he's determined to get there any way, shape, or form. Mm, um, I guess the, the other one that has probably blown a lot of fans away would have to be Joe Joe Gower. Yeah. Um very str- very strange sort of um, obviously as as Leeds perspective to go and get an academy player from another club, which is something that Leeds fans I guess have been used to never happening. It's always been <laughs> yeah. it's always been someone from Leeds going elsewhere. But yeah, I don't want to get carried away because it's very easy to do so. He's only a young man and he's only playing youth football, but he's already he has experience at a higher level. That's where he's been playing. But just the things he does with the ball. Um, it, the ball just sticks to his feet, and the things he tries, um, he's not he's he's not as quick as others. But what he does with the ball, obviously, counteracts that. And he isn't you know he's not slow. He's, he's he is deceptively quick. And again, like Sam, doesn't like losing. Looks like he hates losing. You know, puts his foot in, throws everything into it. So they're probably the three. I'd like to mix back very very close. Niall Huggins, very yeah. very close. Mm. I think he has been incredible. Um, one that's so underrated uh, in terms of mentions would be Cody Drami, another one yeah. that just every single week just churns it out yeah. right back. Like you say, you can, situations. you can list them for days, can't you? Yeah, honestly, I and, I'm, and I'm, not, I'm not just saying that because they might see this and I after this is my job. I'm just, you know, it is, they are a pleasure to watch. They really are. Right. Um, the keeper, Elia, another one, doesn't do much wrong. Always gets them out of trouble when they need him. Um, just a couple of special mentions to... Max Dean and Jeremiah Mullen from the 18s. That when they've been thrown in, they've they don't look like they're young. They're under 18. I'm so I was glad really you impressed with Mullen. Yeah, last week we against Burnley, he was outstanding. I thought. Yeah, we talked about yeah, Mullen and Dean, didn't we, Tom. before? Oh, sorry. We, yes, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say that it's such a big experience from getting that hammer in at Accrington to then 
just keep going and going and then play a high level. And Max Dean, me and Ben um, jokes that when Max Dean celebrates, it's like he scored a goal at Wembley. Like it, it just looks like it means everything. Do you know what I mean? And I, I love that. It's you know he scores a goal and he, he properly celebrates as if there is three thousand people there. <laughs> love it. Yeah. So yeah, they're again. You know, they all stand out, but they're probably the ones that I think have probably have, um, have stood up. And I've 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 not mentioned Jack Jenkins again. Another one that I know on Twitter is massively popular, yeah. um, and that's no discredit to him. And we covered Somerville last week. We've not mentioned him, and obviously he's gone into first team training this week. Yeah, I think um, I don't want to sound I don't want to sound what's the brother word boring, but. I, I think you expect big things from um, Chris Henshaw, obviously where he's come from. Mm-hmm. Obviously the goals he scored when he was playing in Holland and uh, the Netherlands. Um, but yeah, that Burnley performance just, I mean, what can you say about that? You know, he, uh, another one that, he, you know, he's here for his, his trickery and his pace and his goals and his crosses. But I noticed the defensive side of things where he gets back and he seems mm-hmm. to put a lot of tackles in for a um, what you call like a tricky winger. Um, yeah, and he's another one that we've not really seen as much as we'd like. Because obviously he was injured for a little bit, and then obviously you get other players come in, and you know once he goes out, Bobby Camler comes in, yeah. and like I say, you just <laughs> you know Take they're in. all they're, I, yeah. I'd like to think they've all got futures, whether it's whether it's in this team or not, or whether it's at our club, or whether it's at Leeds or not. I, I'm sure they'd all make very good professional footballers down yeah, the line. Definitely. We we've spoken a lot Tom about the. That exactly that the depth of quality in the under twenty threes and the brilliance of uh, either rehabilitating players or when your first eleven drop down and those the kind of education that those lads will get the the younger ones especially when they're able to slip in um, uh, you know uh, earlier on in this podcast we previewed a little bit about Cresswell maybe picking up some of the intercepting and earlier early on in the game the, the things Lorente was doing in terms of game management and reading the game so in, from yeah. your observation. We, we've looked at how, obviously, we've blown some teams away in the under-23s with the quality we've had and the, the passing and the movement. But when we've had to grind a result out, when we've had, like, uh, I think it was the 2-1 against West Brom or even the second half against Stoke, the game, the game just gone, where we, where it's got a bit ugly, discipline maybe went, um, but yeah. they, they've, they've still managed to get over the line. Who do you think has stood out as a leader for you? Who's impressed you as someone that can rally that team to grind that result out? Yeah, that's a very good point you make, actually, because what I'd like to add to that is they didn't do that at the start of the season. So they was they were tunnel up against Wolves. They threw that away. Newcastle yeah. was, uh, I mean, Ben hit, Ben just f- threw his head to the table. Like I was <laughs> laughing at him. It was just like, how on earth have you done that? So I think obviously Charlie's a big part of that at the back in terms of communication. Um, obviously, as the uh, you know, little things for people to pick out for. You'll always notice the ones that, as it goes out for a throw in, Charlie's generally the one that will try and rally them a bit. He did that massively against Burnley. I know it ended four one, but there was like a twenty minute spell against Burnley where they just couldn't seem to get out of our box leads, and uh, you know, they really rallied. I thought no one did that, but but in how he played, not by how he he communicated. I thought he 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 threw himself into every tackle. He, he was everywhere. Yeah. Um, other ones, I tell you, who's quite a dark horse for it, and again, I don't, I don't know him, and I don't know if he, it's effective. But Stuart McKinstry seems to be someone that is constantly, constantly, constantly talking. Um, he moans a lot at the <laughs> officials when it doesn't go their way, and you know, he's he's very passionate. He, he, he's always one to encourage. And I think that's such a massive statement. I know there's, I've read a few articles about him about the the impression he's made and what they think of him, but I think that's quite a big statement for someone to come from another club and within three months. Just go straight into that team and be be giving it everything he's got to to people he's known a few months and it just try to lead by example. I think there's 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 some that do it in in how they play. Again, someone like Sam or Joe that pick up the ball, bring it out of um, out, out out of trouble. Uh, mm. Leif Davis and Niall Huggins did that quite well on Monday. Uh, I forget which day it is in this lockdown, <laughs> but on Monday with with their driving runs out of defence. So I think I think that's, I'd probably say Charlie at the moment is is leading them quite well from the back, but. I just think as together as a unit that they they seem to have really clicked to see to see how things out and they seem to be transitioning well up and down the pitch and no one's really putting on each other under pressure of, you know verbally it's always encouragement so that's the one thing I think they've learned massively in this because it is a step up it's a massive step up from the league they were in last year to this it's huge yeah it really we is. touched on Charlie as a leader earlier and um, to be that strong a leader at not even eighteen and a half years old yet. You know, 
is impressive, I think, at his age. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, obviously, I'm trying to learn stuff from, from family as well, obviously, with the, um, the experience he's had. And, but that could always go the other way. It's a bit of a burden. You know, will, will a neutral fan go, oh, is that is that who that is? Oh, he'll be, I bet he's quite good. You know, it's just, you know, just because of that. I think he's he's just stepped up. And I, I think what I like to watch as well is, um, uh, and Oli Case is probably unfortunate because when we have to fill the bench, he's always in the first team bench. Mm. But when then two slot in together, you can just see that like, they've known each other for 10 years. They've been playing together for years and you, you can see it instantly. And I think that point you made there, Rob, about the first team was coming in, I don't think it looked as disjointed this time around where Tyler drops in or someone drops in because they seem to have learned that from the first couple of years I've been watching them where we always joke about this. The worst ever 23s game we have ever done is we went to crew away and we were joking in the car on the way because um, we had Samu playing. <laughs> We, and we were, I was like, what score are we going to put past these today? <laughs> um, and it was the work, it rained. We were stood at the side of the pitch with the camera at pitch level, which I know the fans hate, um, but we had no other option. It was the middle of, I think it was bonfire night. Um, it, it rained, it was freezing. And the players that were on the pitch, you expected them to lead. And we just couldn't get going. Whereas this year, I think as a collective, they've just learnt massively. That sounds like yeah. Crawley. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was a different experience. Yeah. I wasn't as cold and I was in my house. <laughs> they have dropped in well. I think we were talking about um, the not only the experience that the young ones get when they get to play, you know, even just 45 minutes with, you know, these people, um, your first 11s that can inspire them as such. But also, I think, um, proving their own technical ability. It's like a bit of a litmus test, isn't it? You know, if you've got, I think it was... Um, game before last you've got the the lads down the left that, that were kind of the interplay the overlapping was overshadowed because of some of us hat-trick in a way you look at that and you think the, the quality of, of the balls we were playing and and the the decent engine that the lads put in and it, yeah. it got slightly overshadowed but when these first 11s drop in then they can kind of almost litmus test them against them and say well actually you know if held the cost us you know doing that I can do it as well. And I, I do like yeah. that. You, you tend, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's true of the players, but maybe they see it as an internal competition or they've got something to prove, but it always looks like you say, like it works. It's not, an, not done in a negative way. It's not just, we've got this player. He's been out for six weeks. We need to chuck him in the under 23s just to give him some minutes. It's how can we grind out a result? How can we work as a unit? How can the style of play match the, the first 11s in terms of what maybe Bielsa wants? And I think Cookie submitted a, a good question um, about, what style of player or if any difference you've noticed between Mark Jackson and Cobran from before? Um, is there a difference in how the under 23s are playing this year as to what they were last year? How much of that's influenced by Bielsa? So, uh, I mean, maybe that needs to be worded as a better question from someone for the cast, but I think that's a good way to go um, to ask, to pick your brain on Tom, because that's what it looks like to us anyway. Yeah. So to, to go back to the style, I think one of the, one of the impressive things, I think just from anyone watching football, if you like your football, is they don't try and uh, outdo the first team. So they don't try and do fancy flicks because Pablo's playing next to them. Um, I mean, uh, Perveda is very good at competing with Pablo with Dunlex. <laughs> they are quite good at that. But, the, you know, it isn't like a competition where, oh, he's playing, I've got to do this flamboyant way, I've got to do this. It is just, oh, that's held the cost of playing left midfield. Um, it's just held the cost, you know. It, it, yeah. I think Mark Green, um, Matt Jackson said the other day about the first teamers don't seem to be, you know, they just come in the 23s, they get their fitness in, they get the job done and they committed it. And I think that's such a, um, I think that's such a special thing about the group we've got now as a first, as the first team, they all seem to just really care and really enjoy playing for Leeds in whichever capacity it is. I, I know that they would rather be playing in front of 30,000, you know, rather than a Monday. Um, but I think that's one of the big impacts. I think, to go on your question about the, the comparisons, um, it is very tough to answer that in terms of when we had Carlos, we were in a different league and True. we were playing against, and no offence, we were playing, I remember we were playing against Bolton and I, I felt so sorry for Bolton's team because they just started to get into trouble. Then we were playing 16-year-olds um, and we played at the same pitch we played Burnley and I think they've put six, seven past them and that's not our fault. We've got a job to do and you, they've, they've got to go win that game. But mm. So it's tough to answer in that respect because rather than and I'm, this is no disrespect because they've all got good academies. Rather than playing your Colchesters and your Crews, you're now playing Newcastle, Aston Villa, West Brom, 
So to notice a difference in terms of style of play is, it is difficult. Um, I don't want to do any disservice to, to Carlos Automat to say that there's they've all got the same style because it's Marcelo's because I think they've all got their own unique, um, different ways. It's quite different to not hear um, someone going as mad as Carlos did on the touchline <laughs> in uh, broken English and Spanish. Uh, I used to love listening to Carlos. Um, just a, so passionate. And Mark is as well, obviously very different ways. Um, I think... What I've noticed the biggest difference, and I think, and again, this is no slight on Carlos, is I think the point I made earlier about the 18s coming through has been so much more natural because Mark has known them for so many more years. So he would probably, and I'm not putting words in his mouth, I just, I would just, this is just a generalization, like Jeremiah Mullen, he's probably worked with him for a couple of years. He knows he can play centre back if he needs to, whereas obviously there was more of a progression between Mark, Carlos, and Marcelo last time. So I think that's probably the being the, the easiest thing for me to spot that we've got players that are just coming in for the 18s. We've had, we've obviously entered the EFL trophy. I know we're out of it, which is a, it's a shame, but you know, that was a chance to put the 18s in as well. Mm. Um, but in terms of style of play, obviously we've got this, it is, an, a, it is a lovely style of play to watch. You guys have, are fans. So you know them, the rubbish we've watched over yep. the years. Um, <laughs> I always joke about going to watch the first team and I used to work, I used to do opposite Saturdays. I used to commentate one Saturday, go watch the next and I didn't see a home goal for four and a half months. Um, at one point, <laughs> I just absolutely pants. Um, so we're sort of blessed in that respect but it is just, I think the entire culture down is 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 committed fast-flowing football and they're obviously learning at a young age that to play a couple of positions and um, I guess it'll only work down the line very well for them. So, yeah, it is very tough for me to say, oh, Matt does this and Carlos does this because because of how it's worked out in, in the pandemic. I've not had much chance to you know, to see it as much close up and personal look at training or anything like that. Yeah, so. I think we can all agree on one thing though, which is that Jacko's doing a great job. Mm. Yes, we've praised him before on this podcast. He's doing an outstanding job. Yeah, I think um, I've only met him a couple of times. I, you know, when we did the under-18s games, we do do the under-18s coverage on our UTV when they get into the Cups and... I've met him a couple of times, and he's he's been always been really good. He's, um, you know, he's he's very determined. He's he's just, I think the the step up has been not something I would never say he couldn't do, but I just think the fact we're in a totally different league, the fact that we've got twenty three players getting plucked out of everywhere to go on the bench for the first team, the fact the first team are playing every two or three days because of the situation we're currently in, mm. and he loses certain players, and yeah, I think they've done absolutely brilliantly. Um, the fact that I just said if they're in the mid table, I think they're doing a good job. But the, you know where they are now is um, hopefully is where they stay. Yeah. Obviously, it makes my job a lot easier. But um, <laughs> and I find it'd be great. It's but some exciting um, games yeah. next season, won't they? If they go up, <laughs> we, we, we discussed that the other day, in like as little as we possibly could, because obviously I didn't want to jinx it. But, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'd be it'd be it'd be mega. Yeah, uh, that some of the experiences we've had when we've when we've done it against some of the bigger teams. Um, the under 18s against Manchester United. I mean, yeah, I, 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 how many people went to that game? I mean, it's just not normal, is it? Do you know what I mean? Uh, We've never been normal, have just, we? It isn't, is it? It isn't normal that the under 18s game is probably bigger than any 23s game I did last year. Uh, and the the gulf, the gulf on paper in money spent was ginormous. But yeah, you look at that performance they put in. It just how can you not be proud or how can you not be excited? I guess. Yeah. <laughs> What advice would you give to anyone listening that maybe supports their local team or maybe is passionate um, about um, commentating or wanting to get into that field of work? Uh, what would you say is the best place or how, um, you know, without trying to emulate or copy exactly what you did, what would you be your sound advice for them and how to get started? That's a good, yeah, it's a good question. That um, I guess st- a starting point as a, as a commentator with especially when you go live on a, on a video broadcast like we do is it is just be prepared to always, to always have notes that, I mean, it was the start game that was delayed the other day by five, six minutes. And obviously I was lucky to hand back, but there's times where you don't, and you've got to, you've got to have that waffle time where you, mm. you know, it's like sink or swim really, where you've be prepared, have notes on stuff that you will probably never, ever mention. You see people like, like the legends of the game, like Clive Tiles, Tildesley and, He's got notes on notes on notes, and I, I think I prep well. Um, you know, be prepared, be confident in yourself. Um, I, I don't. I'm not just saying this and saying, "Oh, praise me, praise me." I don't think I'm an amazing commentator, but 
I back myself. You know, I would never talk myself, but be confident in yourself. Um, have fun. That's one of the biggest, one of the most amazing jobs you can ever wish for. If you like your sport, um, I've been obsessed with sport since I was six, and be be as happy. You know, just enjoy every step. The other, the other, other one I'd always say is never say no to any opportunity you get. Um, if it's hospital radio, if it's free work, if it's podcasts like this, you never know where it's going to get you. Um, you know, if if there's any fans listening that wanna wanna get into commentary and they've they're analysing 23's football and they could come on here and spot something that maybe someone else hasn't and that could get them an opportunity uh, and the biggest one I always got told even though I sort of have done it is find a niche find a sport that perhaps no one else wants to do because everyone wants to commentate on football I am sure there is a list of people that want my job um, that want Bryn's job <laughs> yeah <laughs> there, you know there, there is people that want that and, and that is great Um but if you've got a niche for a sport, uh, I'm quite lucky I'm from Leeds and I love rugby league and I, I do rugby league for, for other companies. And when I went to university, some of my colleagues or university students didn't know what rugby league was. So, um, you know. I think that's great um, advice, but I think you've forgotten one bit, which is that for anyone listening, if you hear Tom get any players' names wrong, just email into Leeds United yeah, and say you want his job. <laughs> That's one of the things I always try and never do, <laughs> ever. Um, but no, I can say, and that's one thing is, is uh, and the last one is prepared for dis- be prepared for disappointment. There is a lot of times you will apply for a job in this game where um, you think you're good enough or someone else gets it and it that's just life. And, yeah. you know, you can never, never give in with it. And I've got goals I want to reach that I might never get to, but um, yeah, it's an amazing job that's very competitive but put yourself out there, practice, 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 um, hospital radio, podcast, record yourself, watch match of the day, do other things like that. And um, yeah, just it's it's one of those things that if you get in, um, enjoy the ride because it is, it is some journey. Great advice, mate. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. We've got loads more questions for you, but we're on a short time. So we're going to preview the Wolves game now. So it's the two form teams in the division. Um, us top, obviously, Wolves second, eight points behind us. Um, how do you see this going? Are Wolves are a serious threat to. Can you think we can be caught this season? Obviously, you don't want to say uh, yes or no, but is this one we should be winning, or is it going to be a it's tough, a tough game? game? This it's a tough game. This we we played them last year, and I, and I remember watching that team, and it was a really good game. I remember I, I'm probably going to get it wrong now. I'm like an absolute idiot, but I think Stuart McKinstry had an absolute stormer, and uh, it was when he and Ryan Edmondson were up front, and they were we hit the post and. They've got a very, very good academy team. Um, and you noticed when I've watched them now a couple of times, I look on the Wolves website and a few of them are signing contracts and they've got a, they've got a good base there ready to go. Uh, yeah. It'll be a very, very tough game that I think. Um, not not one that Leeds can't win, of course. Never, I would never say that. But yeah, it's, it's such a big game for, obviously, as you say, guys, the table, which... You know, could go the other way. You know, if if we win that game, if Leeds win that game, and they don't win their game in hand, the the, the gap in points is uh, is pretty tasty. But I am not going to sit here and say that uh, <laughs> if we win, it's over. Because if I have to look at Ben in a three months time and say I first it, then <laughs> I'm not going to be happy at myself. Can you because imagine the shit he'd give you? Well, it's it's obviously such a big opportunity to to, to win that league. Um, I remember writing all the rules out at the start of the season for that for that division. And then looking and thinking, oh, you know, playoffs would be quite nice. Or and then you look at the teams above, and yeah, the the, the games that hopefully fingers crossed fans can attend in a couple of, in a year or two's time would be would be incredible. But yeah, the Wolves Wolves will be a very very tough game. They're a very good team. They work well, and um, yeah, it'd be a good battle. I'm looking forward to it. You know, you, you get certain games where you look and you think, oh, that'll be all right. And like Newcastle um, mm. got a great academy. Um, they've got a player there that. Uh, Anderson that plays for them. He's been on the bench the last couple of weeks for Newcastle. He is a brilliant, brilliant footballer. And it's always good to watch how Leeds' players go up against some of the brightest prospects around him. Yeah, I mean, I think with, with Wolves' game, from my perspective, I think that with us being 2 0 up, like you said, and then it coming back to a 2 all draw, I think my only hope is that with us having a bit more backbone now and a bit more of a, a, a steady defence that seems to know what they're doing. And the man we've talked about today endlessly, Mr. Creswell, who looks spectacular, I think. Hopefully we can keep them keep them out and get and get a decent clean sheet and pick up a, a win. And the, if I was predicting it, I'm I'm going a two nil Leeds. We've played them the last three times we've played them. It was two two draw uh, back in September, a one all draw back in March, and a 
two all draw almost a year to the day, twenty fourth of January last year. It was two two. Was that at their place? Yes. Yeah, so that's the that is the game I'm on about. Two from where, McKinstry. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I, yeah, I'm not trying to. I, I, you know, I, I've done all right. Um, well done, mate. <laughs> I've done all right. Like there. So I say about being prepared. You see what I've been about being prepared, guys. Um, <laughs> yeah, that that was a that was a good game. Um, yeah, I, I guess you know I'm sure Mark Jackson's team talks are always going to be good, but that's probably a good point you make. Obviously, I think that's probably apart from Newcastle that. I would guess that's the most disappointed they've been all season is Wolves. So a chance to right the wrong and 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 the end of that that carrot at the end of it with that points gap is uh, is very big. So yeah, it's a it's a big game of the season. Obviously, it's a big week as well with with the first team coming back and yeah, hopefully it starts off on a good uh, on a good fingers front. crossed. Excellent, Rob. What are you predicting? I'm going two one us win. Yeah, I'll take that. Two one one nil something like that. A Leeds win. Can I'll we get a prediction out of Tom? What do you reckon? <laughs> Yeah, I would. I would probably say two one. I'd uh, I'd agree with that. I, I think they're a good team. Um, I don't want to say two 0 and then I'll be sat in commentary thinking about this. Thing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll say I, I think I think they can do it. It's me, uh, momentum's big with the, with with the twenty threes. Um, they've got it behind them at the minute. And um, you know, the only downside, obviously, is the away. In fact, it's not it's not at our place. So mm, yeah. if it was at our place, <clears throat> I might have said two 0 because our home record is super. Yeah, yeah. sound. Lovely. Well, thank you for joining us, Tom. Where can people find you on Twitter, on social media, and all your other bits and pieces, anything you want to plug? Now's your opportunity. Um, Twitter, I'm just at Hilly15, so H-I-L-L-15. It's just my nickname as a kid and the day of birth. But yeah, that's my that's my Twitter. That's probably the only thing I really use, really. Um, got some decent followers the other week, actually. Um, <laughs> it's been going pretty, you know, as you say, guys, you know, the, the, the 23s is, is booming, but... Yeah, it's you know I'm trying to keep active on there and keep and keep plugging away with, with the 23. If people want to follow me and discuss footy or leads, you know I always try and keep it pretty sensible and um, I like to try and describe myself as someone that doesn't get too carried away when we've lost to Crawley or Manchester United. Um, I try and keep my head down and um, and not get too carried away on Twitter. But yeah, yeah it's always good. Twitter's barmy for leads. Um, I'm sure you all know that. So. Top man. Um, uh, Cookie, where can people find you on Twitter? At Mickledunians, classic. Um, so that is where you will find me chatting shit most days if I am not temporarily banned from Twitter for saying the word cunt. Yeah, there you go. Um, Rob, what about you? You'll find me stalking Tom at Juicy Rob on Twitter. <laughs> uh, you can find me at Rossbow1984. You can find the podcast at Peacock's Raw. All of the stuff uh, we're on YouTube at the Raw and Peacock. The numbers are flying up, so make sure if you're watching the youth pods on YouTube, then make sure you comment. Let us know you're watching. And we had some great feedback on uh, some of it last week. We asked kind of what foot he was, and someone that coached him actually got in touch with us and said we coached him to use both feet. So nice. people are watching, which is good. Thank you very much. Uh, until we are back with a review of a Leeds win against Wolverhampton Wanderers, it's goodbye from me. It's goodbye from Rob. Goodbye. Goodbye from Cookie. Goodbye. And goodbye from Tom. Goodbye, guys. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Most of our stats come from LUFC Stats or LUFC Data on Twitter. You should probably give them a follow as they're more interesting than us. A very special thanks to Adam Warner, Barney Stewart, Cookie, Ewan and Howard Metcalf, Josh Pearson, Laura, Leon and Rob, the light show and all our family and friends.